o'clock. So I'm gonna call this meeting to order. And first up, we have public input. So I see we've got some people in, att in attendance and perhaps they'd like to speak to us about anything on the agenda. So if you are a delegation, this isn't your moment, but if you're here to talk to us about anything else, you can raise your hand and in a moment, um, Rachel will get you get you on live. So if you if you want to do that, put your little hand up. Okay, good. There's John coming in. And the, okay, good. We got two. That's great. So John, we'll start with you. John, I, I think we can hear you. Okay, you're all set. We're all set. Go for it. Great, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak. I'm speaking tonight really on behalf of Eagles Hockey uh, Club as well as the Fossils Hockey Club in regards to the proposed change to the policy in in uh, uh, Ross and Recreation specifically for the arena. And and I don't think what I'm going to say is anything that would change the policy. I don't think the policy is is wrong. I think it's just giving us an opportunity for both of our clubs to talk about the fact that we, we've we had specific ice times for many, many years and our concern is losing those ice times. Um, Eagles have had the same ice time for 40 years. Actually, 40 years ago, we had different ice time and had it moved uh, 25 years ago to, in order to accommodate uh, um, public skating, which was great. Um, the fossils have had the uh, the same ice time for now 38 years, and and our concern is the fact that we always have worked with the special events. If there's a Warriors game, if there's a tournament going on, um, whichever there's we've we've had no problem adjusting to that. Um, our biggest concern is losing the ice times is actually being shifted later. None of us are getting any earlier in age. So it makes it a little tougher to roll out of bed at 10 o'clock at night to go put your skates on. Um, so our, our, our ask is that when you're looking to reschedule, and like I say, this doesn't have an impact with the policy because I don't think the policy really changes the way that we operate it. I think our concern is just the fact that we would lose our ice time and, and that would be um, certainly something that would be uh, close to all of the eagles and all of the fossils hearts to lose that. Okay, great. I'm going to just give Christy a chance to to address your concern there. I think you're right. I think the policy doesn't uh, do that. But let's just see what Christy has to say on that. Um, well, the I mean, the policy, the way it has been and the way it could be if approved moving forward, which the change there wouldn't make a change to what we've been doing as far as the size time. But yes, there is always the potential for them getting shifted later and later at night as the youth needs increase. So this is the balancing act of the ice time at the arena is that minor hockey specifically, as well as other youth groups, but they're the big one, they do get priority booking with the way the policy is with the youth taking priority. Now, the problem is, is they, I mean, it's a balancing act. It's for council to decide how to handle that. We, we've tried in the past having um, a policy where return bookings get priority over, um, so for example, returning men's user group would get priority of their ice over new youth time. Uh, the reason that that changed a number of years ago was because for the fields, we had men's softball teams that had all the field time booked and then the co-ed teams with the women couldn't get a, a field time. So it's, I can see both sides. It's a tough one to balance. Okay. Thanks. John, do you want to yeah. add anything else? I, I was just going to say, thanks, Christy. And I understand that. And I think everyone on in our hockey clubs understand that as well. Um, and certainly even even the way the policy is written now um, that doesn't that didn't change things like I say it's it more or less becomes a concern of of us losing our ice times and and Christy's right the policy used to read that way uh, maybe there could be a consideration of an adaption to the policy to uh, to take into account long use um, long use occupants Okay, great. Thank, thanks for that input. That's great. Okay, let's see who's up. Dane, you are, have your hand up there. 
Hi, yes, um, I'm here to speak about the ice allocation as well. Um, name is Dine Parker and I'm representing the Rossland Warriors. Um, I'd like first off to start by thanking the Smokeettes and the Recreation Department for helping us secure ice times for games in the past. Um, without that help, we uh, the Warriors wouldn't be able to operate. Um, so it's been great and we really appreciate that. Um, so I wanted to start off with that. Um, we do agree the priority should be given to youth groups, if all else equal. Um, but if a team or a club is struggling to keep the program alive due to ice times that they are provided with, we think that should be made a priority. I don't think we should allow clubs to fold because we cannot secure reasonable ice times. Um, the Warriors are in that situation currently. Um, for many reasons, we do require um, a, a weekly ice time on Tuesday night around 6 to 7 p.m. Um, if we can't secure that, we are at risk of, of folding the team. Um, I'm happy to see that major events are number two on the prior priority list, but we do disagree with um, the city sponsors activities being listed as priority number one. Um, I recall one of the major reasons to push um, for the shutdown of the arena was the financial viability. Um, doesn't the city sponsored activities bring in the least amount of money? Um, shouldn't we prioritize groups that are paying for the ice? Uh, our suggestion is, is that um, major events has priority number one, local youth is priority two, local adults is priority three, and city sponsored is priority four. Um, and then we have school bookings is five, local one-off bookings is six, and local non-local bookings is seven. Um, <clears throat> we also don't think the priority list should be everything that is considered when allocating ice time. Um, other things to consider, you know, the compensation that is paid, the health of the club, the club's importance to the arena and the economy, the local economy, and the use by locals. Um, the Warriors pay the highest rate of ice. We are losing players due to our ice time. And we increase traffic to all the local businesses when we have games. Um, and we, we have one of the highest, if not the highest user rates of the facility when we have games which have 300 to 600 people attending. Um, I don't feel like we should have to fight for reasonable ice times in Rossland. We need some help, and we're gonna if we're gonna be able to continue to operate as a as a team. Um, that's all I have right now. Um, appreciate uh, you listening and allowing us to come here and voice our concerns. Okay, thanks, um, Christy. Do you have any comments there for those points? Uh, yeah, just speaking to the city sponsored stuff. Um, the reason why that slid into number one there is um, it is in, it is standard practice amongst municipalities, and it is the only opportunity for the public who are not a member of a team to have access to the facility. So what we do see on a lot of the with the minor hockey and some of the other user groups that book weekly, their membership base is a, a mix between Roslyn Trail regional stuff, whereas the city stuff is typically mostly or essentially just Roslyn people coming to public skates or, or inter internal programming. Um, and then as far as the Warriors specifically, uh, it is a tough situation because they, they would have priority, as Don mentioned, for their games, which is great if we passed this policy as is but it's their weekly practices that they're struggling with to get the ice time. And not only are they adults, so that puts them below the youth, but because they had that break, uh, they're not, they're, they're working around the schedules of people like the Eagles and such that have been consistent. And they, we put those people in who have had the same ice times every year. And then the warriors would kind of slide into what's left after. So it's not leaving them a lot of options. Um, but that, that ice time that they want is bumping something else. So you know, we can't just increase that time because nobody does want to get on the ice at 10, 11 p.m., let alone the staffing side of it. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, it's a tough call. It is um, some some other user policies, ice user policies take 
um, a certain level of hockey, like junior A, junior B, and they would prioritize that team. For example, you see that with the Smokies, uh, they get priority ice time over your, your beer league men. Um, so that's a consideration to look at for specifically for the Warriors team. Um, that's all I can really suggest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that def definitely is is a tough one. It would be nice if we could come to some kind of a, maybe a, a compromise of some sort that doesn't completely wipe out one group, but certainly allows the Warriors, and, and with the consideration that they, that they do bring people to town and they do have a lot of spectators and that kind of thing. There's another... I yeah, I will confirm Diane's comment there on on the biggest user of the or the highest use of the facility during the games is yeah. the Warriors. That is correct. As far as the ice time goes for their practices and their games um, and the revenue, the ice rates are the same for all adult groups. And in fact, when we have a game like the Warriors and it's wonderful for town, wonderful to see so many people out at an arena. But because we have 300 people in that arena, we do have to extra staff it a lot of the time. And it is the same revenues we get for that versus um, any other beer league using the facility. So, you know, it, it's got a definitely an economic boost for the pubs in the, you know, the, the places around town, uh, not directly into the city. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dan, you have anything, any other comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, I, I mean, I just wanted to voice where we were coming from and I, I understand there's a lot of moving parts um, and we by no means want to bump a long-term user um, we just, we're just having increased troubles getting players out for practice because, um, you know, we have a lot of people coming in from Casagar and Nelson and, um, there's a few guys from Grand Forks and if we can't get, you know, an earlier ice time, they just don't show up. And then we end up with, you know, 10 guys at practice and, you know, it, it's a snowball effect, right? Um. The games and ice working around with games or working around ice time with games has been great. Um, like I mentioned, the smoke cats have been awesome, and so is the uh, recreation department, and we really appreciate that. Um, but as you would know, if we are playing any sort of decent level of hockey, we're going to need to get some practices in there as a team. Um, so. So can, can I ask you, how have the, how have the practices scheduling gone in, in the past, when just in the recent past? So we did end up with a, actually a pretty good ice time, not this season. Um, we, we didn't operate due to COVID, but the season before, right. but we were on a Wednesday night um, at the same time as the, uh, I, I guess, the trail old timer smoke eaters play. And there was all of our coaching staff plays on that team and, you know, some of the players. And so we were really getting, it was really tough to, you know, have our coaches come up and run practices. So what was happening was, you know, players that had a little bit of coaching experience were running the practices and, um, and we did get decent turnout at that time. Um, so it was earlier, I believe it was 645, which was great. We just, with you know it being on a Wednesday night it really impacted us um Thursday would be another night that really impacts us because a hundred percent of the players either play in the commercial league the in trail the Cascar commercial league or the Nelson commercial league and which all play on Thursday nights so um, just just brainstorming here ideally what would you be looking for Ideally, we'd be looking for our number one priority would be a, like a Tuesday night around six or seven o'clock. Um, but we we only practice every second week, so bi-weekly Tuesday nights. And so that would free up, you know, every second week for public skate or minor hockey. Or, um, if we couldn't get Tuesday, Monday would be our best option. Um because Friday, you know, we, we try to schedule games Friday and Saturday um, so we can, you know, maximize the, um, the amount of people we can get out to games. Uh, okay. So Friday and Saturday would be, would, wouldn't work for us. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's good information. Good information to have. So, and, and thanks for that. Um, yeah. Council, you have any question of, uh, 
uh, either of our two public input speakers while we've got them here lively. No, okay. Um, okay, thanks you guys. So John, uh, I had a question um, with the, uh, how many, John, I was, uh, do you know how many guys we lost uh, last year that just said, I, I'm not gonna play or on those later ice times? I, do you have a stat for that? You see John on there, Kathy? Oh, Kathy, you're muted. Yeah, John's still on there, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. There um, he is. He's can back. you hear me now? Yep. There you are, John. Yeah. So, so Terry, to be fair, I don't know. I don't know that stat. Uh, there was a lot involved with COVID. It wasn't only an ice time change. It was also guys just weren't comfortable playing. Um, so I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would hesitate to say it was just because of ice time. Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to put it out there uh, to our attendees. If there's anyone else who'd like to speak in public input, um, Alicia, I see you're there and I'm assuming you're there from Midtown, which I will adjust in the, uh, in the agenda. If you could just put your hand up to make sure that works for you and okay, good. Okay, and if you want to speak now about anything, you can. Otherwise, we'll just be carrying forward. So you've got your hand up for, do you want to speak? We'll see. <laughs> hand down, okay. <laughs> okay, so kind of awkward to run these Zoom meetings. Um, okay, so we are going to move on to the approval of our agenda, and I would like to move item 8B, oh, 8, I think it's 8B, hold on, lost myself here. No, that's not it. It is eight. Yeah, it is eight B. I'm going to move that up um, to right after our approving the minutes in five. So with that uh, change, can I get a mover? Andy moves and a seconder. Jenna seconds. Any comments on the agenda? All in favor? <laughs> okay. Yay. Oh, uh, Cynthia has something. Um, we just noticed a technical issue with the agenda. There is an item missing. Um, 8D, a request for counsel regarding sidewalk cafes, um, was somehow omitted out of the agenda package, and um, we're just figuring that out now. So if we could add that back in, uh, Rachel's going to work on getting you that information ASAP and back into okay. the agenda there. Is that something that you could give us an oral overview of, Cynthia? Uh, Stacy will be able to. Okay. Okay. That'll be, that'll be great. Okay, so we are, our agenda is, adopt, is adopted with that one change for 8B and adding in that other item that went into the ether. And with that, we're gonna move on to our registered delegation, the community garden. So that is Penny and Laura, you guys are our speakers and you may take it away. And congratulations on your, uh, your Rosenders Who Care grant win. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you see me? Are they supposed to see me, Rachel? We'd love to see you, but we don't see you. We see your names. You should be able to uh, use your video now. I just promoted you to a panelist. There you are, Laura. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I've not been promoted. Oh, Penny, you are promoted in our hearts. Just give Rachel a minute. <laughs> Sorry, Penny, you should be good to go now. Uh, I still don't see her. There we go. Yay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right. Well, um, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Penny Johnson. I'm with the Rotary, the Roslyn Rotary Community Garden. And with me is Laura Jackman. She's with the Roslyn Summit School. And on behalf of the garden, the school and the Roslyn Society for Environmental Action, we'd like to thank the council in the city of Roslyn for this opportunity to present so that we can inform the city about our plans regarding the relocation of the Roslyn Rotary Community Garden. So just some uh, background first. So in May uh, 2010, the Roslyn Community Garden was constructed at Jubilee and 7th Avenue, and it's adjacent to the Roslyn Summit School. And it was a community dream of intergenerational uh, gardening at the time, and has served many members in the community since it was completed. The garden was made possible from a $20,000 uh, grant from the community, uh, the Columbia Basin Trust. 
And uh, in 2015, the garden received an additional 716 from the CBT for purchasing uh, group insurance, for being able to build a new tool shed and pollinator shrubs. And uh, approximately $600 is collected on an annual basis from members. And the city of Roslyn uh, contributes in kind of uh, the water services, as well as repairs to the site, as well as grass cutting around the fence. In 2016, that's when we noticed the flood. The community gardeners began to notice that the garden soil was heavily saturated as the nearby wetland was beginning to expand into the lower portion of the garden. And over the past few years, members of the community garden have struggled with these water issues as the saturation of the garden soil significantly has reduced the quality and the quantity of the food that we're able to produce. As well, the cold mountain runoff delays the early planning schedule to the end of May or the beginning of June. So last year, for example, we lost 60% of our garlic crop because of the water issue, because the ground was so heavily saturated. Uh, as well, the overall productivity of each garden has gone down probably in the past three years, 10% uh, a year. Uh, in addition, we have an increase in aquatic plants, such as horsetails, which have overtaken many of the garden plots, leading to a higher failure rate of seed crops. And this has re again reduced the potential positive educational and food generating possibilities of these plots. As a result, we've had some members who've abandoned their plots halfway through the season or near the end due to the poor conditions. And the community gardeners now realize that instead of fighting nature, we better do something about it. And we think that the garden should be relocated to the adjacent higher and drier ground at 7th and St. Paul Street. Luckily, in September 2020, the grade seven late French immersion class at RSS became aware of the issues faced by the community garden and embarked on a project to help relocate the garden. In March 2020, the project received $10,000 from the 100 Roslanders Who Care fundraiser organized by the Roslyn Rotary Club in order to help us move this project forward for the community of Roslyn. So for this presentation, we have two goals. The first one is to inform the city of Roslyn that the Roslyn Society for Environmental Action will be applying for the Columbia Basin Trust's small environmental grant to complete a landscape plan for the North Jubilee Park. This plan will be completed by Eva Cameron and will consult with the Roslyn Community Garden, the Roslyn Summit School, as well as the City Works and the planning staff will involve also an architect accessibility consultant in the design. And we're requesting as a result of this, a letter of support from the city of Roslyn for this grant proposal. Secondly, we'd like to inform the city of Roslyn that upon completion of the plan, we'll be requesting an in-kind donation from city operations for the re relocation of the water line to the new garden site, as well as the operation of a bobcat and excavator in order to move the soil to improve drainage. Laura? Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to tell you all the reasons why this project is going to be so awesome. Um, I am a teacher at RSS, and I've been using the restored wetland space for several years now in order to deliver my curriculum to my students. This fall, um, as a result of COVID, and because I love to take kids outside, a colleague and I work together to develop a program at RSS that ensures that every kindergarten to grade six student receives 100 minutes of structured instruction time uh, outside in the community garden and the wetland area. Uh, and those spaces have just proved to be so invaluable for this program. Uh, having the garden relocated in the subsequent expansion of the wetland will allow me to further develop my programming out there. The new relocated garden will have 20 beds, five of which will be allocated to RSS, and it will be wheelchair accessible and ensure that to ensure that it's inclusive for everyone. RSS will benefit from this project by having access to more garden spaces, which will allow us to start growing food for the school lunch program, the cafeteria, and the grade eight and nine home economics class. Community members will also benefit from this project because they'll be able to access the new and drier garden earlier in the season, as well as higher quality soil, which will increase their crop yields. Community initiatives will be able to use the space to deliver workshops on sustainable practices such as permaculture, composting, food preserving, and bear awareness. 
This project will involve the students of the RSS and community members from start to finish. It's uh, completing this type of action project will have a lasting effect on my students. This will be a diverse space for community members to come together to learn about food security, species biodiversity, and will engage this whole community in a positive manner. That's great. Um, do, you have, do you have more, Penny? Well, do you want to know about the money? Well, yeah, we want to know about money. I mean, we do. Okay. We do know. Uh, about, we do know about this project, and and we are, you know, um, very enthusiastic to see the plan and how that's going to play out. And for you to work, <clears throat> excuse me, for you to work very closely with city staff on that plan because there's some synergies there that are going to be that are going to be fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a question about when when you need the letter of support. What's the timing for that? Uh, Laura, I I believe it's now as soon as possible. It's now it's now. Yeah, um, I am working with Eva to work uh, on the CBT grant, which I think we have to have in by the thirtieth of April, which will be the fastest grant I've ever written. You can do it, Laura. I have no doubt. Um, okay, so if you have more on the presentation, I want to, before we move forward, I want to just see if council has any questions there. I think we're, oh, Terry does. Hi guys, um, really exciting. Can you talk about uh, the rehabilitation of the wetland. So if you move the community garden, what's the what's the wetland area going to look like? Laura? Um, yeah, so where the community garden is right now is already um, going down the path of becoming a wetland. And I mean, Dirk can probably talk to this a lot as well. Um, but it does happen very naturally. As we've seen, um, part of the plan that Eva will be putting together which is uh, um, will include moving the soil and swaling it out so that it drains properly into all the right places, which will just kind of invite the wetland to be doing that. Um, as far as the restoration went uh, for the pre the wetland that you see there now, there's like, you know, other than once you move the soil, there's not much work that has to go into its maintenance. Okay, uh, no, no trees, uh, no cedars or any, any other, just let it be a uh, wetland okay yeah there's some willow stakes that we'll throw into the ground here and there but other than that um yeah great thank you okay penny did you have more to add i don't see any more questions um the only thing we have to add but i mean you already have that in the presentation is the budget that we've outlined and and which is fairly self-explanatory as well as the timeline that has, we've spent a fair bit of time trying to make it work. So by the time fall 2021 comes along, uh, we'll be able to start rebuilding the community garden, slowly moving everything over. And this is, uh, this is a good time because then the kids will get back from school and they'll be able to do a lot of the manual work as well as using it as an outdoor ed experience with some of the learning modules that, that uh, Laura will be able to incorporate. Um, next to that, uh, no, I think, uh, Laura, do we have anything to else? I think just the fact that we need to spend that money from the Rotary um, by fall 2021. So we're really hoping, uh, which won't be a problem, <laughs> I'm sure, but we're really hoping that um, we can get this CBT grant. Otherwise, we'll just move some stuff around. And I've got a few other grants in my back pocket as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's great. Well, we we always appreciate child labor, so super. Um, Stuart, you got your hand up. Yeah, it just occurred to me that the uh, the area that you're proposing to move to um, has there been some sort of process to establish that it's not required for anything else. Um, I don't think it's a it's a high priority use, but I do know that uh, it's a popular place for. Uh, youngsters to slide on rails and it is right next to the scouts hall of the scouts being consulted on this um i actually haven't talked to the scouts but it's not on their property and they mostly use the space like um between the between st paul and the building Stewart, mm -hmm. if they do it all which they don't Right mm -hmm. now, um, I'm the one who uses the space where the garden would be relocated the most. It wouldn't affect any of the rails. Um, they do it on the other side of me, and mm -hmm. I took that into consideration. Um, okay. Really, it, it used to be where the uh, basketball court was, so that's why it's a little higher and it's flatter. 
And um, yeah, like I'm really the only one that uses that space at the moment. And so it's, I so don't. It's, so it's right, sort of right up at the, the end of the, of the sort of the right, right on the corner there. Than yeah, towards it's, the direct, south. it's directly adjacent to where the garden is right now. Um, my, the learning shed that's out there, it would be on the, uh, what is that? The Monte North Cristo side, side of that? Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, I understand exactly. now. Yeah. And that is, that is, you know, obviously it's city property and, and we've sort of earmarked it for this, for this transition a couple of years ago, as long as, as long as all the ducks line up. So, yeah. Any more questions for these lovely folks? I don't see any hands up. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, so next up, we have a few minutes to do. So take a motion on the minutes of the Heritage Commission that they be adopted. Who moves it? Uh, Andy and a seconder. Chris, any comments? All in favor? Okay, and then we've got minutes of our regular meeting on the 6th, the mover for adoption on that. Terry and somebody, uh, Janice, any comments on that? All in favor? Okay, now we're going to move up 8B, which was, I got my pages out of here. This is the big exciting thing, and we're doing this because we have Alicia on the phone, who's from City Spaces. So this, I'm not going to read the whole motion, but this is on page 157 of your package. It's the proposed Midtown Mixed Use Development Project, Tender Review and Award. Um, so like I say, I'm not going to read the whole thing unless I have to, but it's in the agenda. Do I have a mover? Chris moves it, Andy seconds it. Any discussion and questions on this that you'd like to make? Anybody? <laughs> Yahoo. Yahoo, that's right. I'd say that's a perfect comment. Um, okay, I'm gonna call the question then. All in favor of the motion as written. Okay, fantastic, unanimous. And we are off to the races on that one. All right, and uh, Alicia, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a little, anticlimactic, but we've been quite familiar with this as we've been going through um, our work. Okay, so now we're back to uh, seven policies and bylaws. This is Notice Enforcement Adjudication System Bylaw 2749, and we are reading this a second time. Do I have a mover? Janice moves it and a seconder. A seconder, come on guys, Terry, thank you. Um, okay, do we have some, uh, we have some discussion? Janice, would you like to say anything about it? The only thing I was going to say is that I, I'm, this is a draft. I noticed that uh, as it went through on some of the bylaws, the graphic, the one page bylaws, that there was just some placeholder wording in there versus the actual wording for the head. Yeah, on the info sheet. But, uh, other than that, yeah, this is going to be a, yeah, all that bylaw stuff is going to be ongoing, obviously, as per the agenda. Um, we'll be revisiting that over and over again, but uh, this looks like a really great start, and I appreciate staff's hard work on this. Yeah, I think it's going to be great too. Dirk. Yeah, <clears throat> the only two comments I had was on page 43, uh, penalties for individuals for the handing out the plastic bags. Um, I'm not really that comfortable with that. That strikes me as a minimum wage person at the front counter handing out a bag i think that that should be back to the business rather than having you know like a half margin penalty for a staff person giving out a bag the onus is on the business not the individual person yeah i think that's a good point cynthia can you comment on that for us um i'd have to look at the bylaw itself but uh we if if it, the wording is exact it mentions the person giving out the the bag, it would probably imply the employer um, as, well, as the person getting the penalty. Maybe there we should make that more specific to say the employer. So we would well, have to amend that bylaw and that would have nothing to do with this, this bylaw at this point in time. Can I, can I oh, just say it is on. specified. We're, I'm sorry, we're on the enforcement adjudication system bylaw. Oh, I see. You're you're just referencing the penalty page in there, right, Dirk? That's right. So it's referencing the uh, single use plastic bag bylaw. That would be the bylaw to amend, not this one. Okay. 
So I can fix that one. I can fix this in, in this one um, once the plastic bag one is is fixed. Okay, so for tonight, can we still go ahead and do second and third reading with the understanding that we want that tiny, tiny little change on both of them? Yeah, I, I'll take note of that. Okay, I think that's great. Dirk? Uh, the only other change that I thought about or was the smoking and vaping is those are pretty low penalties. I'd rather see those go up. I don't like following underneath the no smoking sign, somebody's smoking on the sidewalk. Again, we'd, you, council would have to amend the, the um, governing bylaw. Okay. Um, and then it will be, it will, this bylaw will reference that. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead with this one tonight and we can, and, and Cynthia's made a note of that. We can go back and review that next one at the, at the proper time. Yeah, if you'd like to go back and uh, amend the smoking and vaping bylaw, I'd suggest council makes a motion to, to direct staff to do that. Okay, and I think that one that one's probably a bigger discussion than changing in, in person to employee. So um, yeah, let's let's finish second reading and third reading on this and then, <clears throat> then we can add that in. I'm sorry, I'm choking on something. Um, Stuart, you had your hand up. I think when we uh, we did the first reading of this, we made the point that the fact that things are actually going to be enforced now might require a review of of many of our penalties, and that uh, perhaps that, that's something we we should uh, perhaps put some time aside to, to actually do. It's one thing to have hypothetical bylaws in place, but if we're actually going to do something about them, it might be worth uh, revisiting a whole bunch of things. Exactly. And just to add, that is part of this um, uh, implementation of this type of bylaw enforcement. Uh, in the staff report, it did reference that we will be going back through some of our other bylaws and actually um, assigning penalties to things that don't actually have a penalty assigned to them. Okay. Chris. Um, well, to that point, um, can we add like a step like if you actually put the dog poo in the bag and then throw the bag on the ground, um, <laughs> is there extra money that we can add to it? <laughs> Please. Um, I jest, but I'm kind of serious too. You're kind of serious? Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that counts as the same thing, right? That if the dog poo, whether it's bagged or not bagged, is is on the ground, it hasn't been picked up. Pick up, put it in a bag, put it back on the ground, it's still on the ground. So I kind should of- should be extra. It should be extra. Extra. <laughs> um, Cynthia, you want to comment on that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to let that one go, Chris, but great, great intention for sure. Okay, anyone else on this? We're on second reading. We're going to do third reading in a second, unless there's anything more to add. Guys, good. All in favor, second reading. Okay, and now third reading. Who wants to move it? Janice moves, Andy seconds. Any further discussion? Did anything happen in the last 20 seconds that we need to revisit? I think not. All in favor. Okay, thanks. That's great. Okay, so now next up, we have recreation facilities and user allocation policy. Okay, so we heard some uh, we heard some comments on this tonight. I want a mover and a seconder, and then we'll talk about it. Mover, Janice moves. Uh, are we, are uh, looking, I'm looking at a different agenda because I'm looking at fees and charges for recreation next. Oh, hold on. Did I go? Did I, see, I don't have my stuff. I don't have my stuff stapled this time. Did I miss it? Oh, I did. I did. I did. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No I that, that out of order because I pulled out our other thing. Okay, sorry. Fees and charges for recreation parks, cultural services review. Thank you, Janice, for that. This is for adoption. Uh, mover and a seconder. Janice moves it and Stu seconds it. Anything new on this one as we adopt? Nothing. All in favor? Okay, great. All right, five-year financial plan. Oh my goodness, second time as amended. Who wants to move this one? Janice, seconder, Chris, comments? Fantastic performance by Elma tonight, once again. All good, all in, Ada. yeah, there we go. Okay, let's do it again for third reading. 
Um, Janice moves it. Andy seconds it. I don't think we need to even talk about this. All in favor. OK. OK, now we are going to 8D, which is the patios. So this came in. Um, did everybody see it? It's, can, is it possible to just get a, to, to get a verbal on this? I know it came in. Rachel sent it to everybody. But I've got so much stuff open on my screen, I'm probably going to screw it up and lose all of you. Is it possible to just get a verbal on this, or do we really need to look on it? Um, Hold on. Um, we're still on the bylaws there. We're on to D, municipal rate bylaw number 2754. Oh, I put 8D on the wrong thing. Oh my God, I need a stapler. Okay, so we're putting, we're putting the patio, the patios aren't going in here, sorry. The patios are what? They are? The patios will be 8D. 8D? Yep. Oh, well. Okay, that's well, what I was doing. We just did 8C, so I was about to do 8D, but you well, want to... We're, we're on 7C. <laughs> oh, oh my God, I'm in trouble here. Okay, 7C. Seven, I see what happened. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Municipal rate, tax rate bylaw 2754. This is first, second, and third. Who wants to go for this one? Somebody raise their hand. Okay, Dirk and Andy, any comments on this one? Comments or questions? All in favor? Good, looks good. Um, okay, Ofer Reservoir, local tax rate 27.55, a mover. Terry and Stuart, any comments here? Comments, okay, all right, all in favor? Okay. Uh, Red Mountain specified area tax rate 2756 and this we are doing for a first, second and third time. Mover, Dirk and Janice, comments? All in favor? Okay. Um, policy review land transaction. This is that we reconfirm our policy, our land transaction policy as presented with no changes. Mover, Janice and Chris, any comments? Stuart, you have a comment? Yeah, I had a question for staff around uh, surplus property. You know, do we have a process or have we had a, you know, some sort of review over the land we have and the, the future needs as a community? Um, it just says, anything we declare as surplus, we, we, we can get rid of according to this policy. But I'm wondering if we've uh, attempted to go about this in a, in a methodical way. Yes, we have. Um, a number of years ago, I want to say maybe four or five years ago, we, we did a whole strategy, a land strategy, and this policy came out of that strategy. So yes, we have identified lands for possible acquisition and lands for um, possible sale as well and identified what needs to happen if we sell them and a, a bunch of other stuff. I can um, forward that to you. Okay, and then potentially if through the, uh, the upcoming OCP process, community priorities change in any significant way, that perhaps that may need to be reviewed? Yeah, possibly. Um, but every, um, we just don't put, um land for sale without bringing it to council first um so we do and as part of that review to council we go through all of those things in the land transaction policy and think about that land is are we ready to sell it is it still on the list of possible surplus land and and same with uh, acquisition as well so th that does evolve every time we bring something to council okay i'd like to, i'd like to just check it over sometime yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yeah, you can just put it in the info package, Stacey, and circulate it to everybody. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was quite a bit of time spent on that because it, it hadn't been in existence before. So it's that's a good thing. Okay, anything else on this or I'm going to call the question? Don't see any hands. All in favor? Okay, great. Okay, pesticide and herbicide use policy. And this is that we reconfirm the policy as presented. Dirk, you want to move that one? Dirk moves it. Who's the seconder? 
Second, Derek. Andy, okay. Any comments? Derek, I'll start with you. No, I, I, I'd be keen to dig into this deeper at some point, but uh, yeah, it's past my resource capacity now. Okay, but you know what? It'd be good to put it on, on your list because you do have some expertise in that area. And, um, you know, maybe it'll, it'll come around next year. One more kick at it. Yep. Andy, anything for you? Just that, you know, we continue to uh, debate the value of that. The city has made some progressive steps to try and minimize use of cosmetic pesticides and herbicides in the community. Um, I don't know how much teeth we've got in that. Maybe with the new bylaw, we can, uh, you know, bylaw enforcement, we can strengthen our, our position on that. And uh, obviously as well, just to remind folks that we do have issues with knotweed um, and the best so far, one of the best ways to deal with it is pesticides or herbicides, I should say. So um, yeah, un unfortunately in some circumstances it's necessary, but the controlled use of it with you know, certificate, certified personnel, et cetera, is, is pretty important. There was an incident recently as a beekeeper, there was an incident recently in Warfield um, where uh, someone lost some, a couple of hives actually, their whole bee population to poisoning. And it was, it's attributed to uh, cosmetic pesticides. Uh, so it's important that we continue to educate uh, our community. And I think generally most people recognize the risk of using those and likely avoid them. Uh, not only for bees, but for their pets and for children, et cetera. So I, I, I'd like to us continue to be advocates of, of non-use um, and make sure that we're promoting uh, the own, our own city use as well, obviously. But I know yeah. in the past we've had these conversations before. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, we're trying for sure. Okay. Uh, no other. Oh, Terry. Yeah. Uh, I was going to bring this up in my um, members report, but uh, on April 14th, uh, as part of the OCP thing, we had, uh, I sat with, um, uh, Vanessa, Bear Smart, Invasive Species, and they talked about a, a strategic plan um, for invasive species. And Dirk, maybe you know about this as well, but you know, we've got, um, they patted us on the back in the city of Rawson for having a knotweed um, strategy, but uh, that it went, that we could um, expand that and, and come up with an actual, uh, you know, in terms of trail building, trail maintenance, uh, building design and plants and things like that. So I thought that that was an interesting uh, idea and uh, that might incorporate what some of Andy's talking about. Yeah, okay, Dirk. Yeah, I, I, I'm, unfortunately I missed a bit of what Andy said. We had a, had a chaotic child explosion next to me, but um, the, the difficulty with the pesticide control is that the things that you can go buy at Canadian Tire are not good things. And until those are controlled, it's very, very difficult. That's where most of the poisonings come from. And then to Terry's point, yeah, the Invasive Species Group has got some great plans to facilitate. Um, I'm going to turn off now, but yes, great stuff. OK. All right, so this is work in progress, but uh, we're, we're trying our best. So I'm gonna call the question on this, all in favor? Okay, and uh, Dirk is not here, but we still have quorum and I'm sure he'd vote for it anyway. Um, okay, so next we have our recreation facilities user allocation policy. Here we are, that's right where I was 10 minutes ago. Um, and that this is that we uh, approve it as amended. So we'll get a mover and a seconder and we'll have a discussion. Janice moves it and who's a seconder? Somebody, one of you guys. Why are the guys so much slower than the girls? I just don't get it. Terry put his hand up first, he's our seconder. Okay, Janice, comments? Yeah, I, had a, I did have a couple of emails back and forth with Christy today, really good conversation about this. Um, I generally like the way that she's updated the descriptions of the user groups for, um, for the uh, arena facility and for the uh, fields. And once again, this year, I forgot that it didn't apply to the miners hall. So thank goodness staff keeps us online. Um, what, how we do it um, and how we've managed it previously, my only quibble with it at all is I'd like to see one and two switched because really that's how we manage it now. 
Um, if we and so if that's how we're managing it now, because we're not defining major events in the policy, we're defining it internally that gives the uh, staff, the recreation staff, a little bit of flexibility as far as how they work around and how they negotiate with people. Um, and if we switch those to, um, you know, and I use the I use the um, example, the obviously it's a made up example, but I use the example of say, you know, a family that wanted to have a uh, happened to want to have a skating party uh, for someone's a little one's birthday, and maybe it falls when a Warriors game is, or maybe it fo falls in the Smokettes tournament or something like that. In theory, if uh, if they wanted to use our public skate to hold that skating party and they go off and have hot dogs and cakes. Uh, our policy would suggest that they could preempt a high use, high revenue major event um, because they want to have six kids skating at public skate. So we do manage it the other way now. So I'd like to see our policy policy reflect the way we're actually managing it. Okay, so do you see some language change there that you would suggest? Yeah, I would just switch one and two. Okay. Um, okay, so that is an amendment. Um, do I have a seconder on the amendment? Okay, Stuart seconds it. Um, and then uh, Janice, do you wanna speak any more about the amendment? I think you kind of covered it. Stuart, do you wanna to add to the amendment? Well, it seems reasonable to me, but I'd like to hear from staff. Okay. Uh, staff can chime in and then I see Dirk's hand is up too. Uh, yeah, I did discuss this with Janice today. The only reason um, example that I can see of that this would get in the way of would be, for example, because Greater Trail Minor Hockey Tournaments happen almost every second weekend. Um, we do currently ask them to free up an hour in the afternoon on a Saturday or a Sunday so we can allow some public skates to happen on the weekend. Otherwise, it could be um, you know, taken over by the all the tournaments every weekend, and there isn't that opportunity for the public to access the facility on the weekends, which is why I have it there, because the only person that is going to enforce that one is me and our department. So, you know, I wouldn't bump a major tournament for a one simple thing, but it does allow me the ability to work with minor hockey, for example, and have them keep an hour gap in the afternoon to allow the public to have access, but I can work with it either way. Okay. Um, Dirk. Yeah, I, I, I thought about and appreciated what Dine and uh, Mr. Sullivan talked about and is it possible to have a, two things, kind of a legacy category in there? It, it seems really counter to the spirit of the arena if we don't have room for the folks that have been using it for a very long time to continue to use it when it's convenient and their bones let them get out of bed. Um, and then is it possible to cap these things? Like I wouldn't want to get into a situation where youth want 100% of the ice time I mean, it's we could prioritize youth up to 58% and then adults up to the next 30% or something like that, rather than very open. Yeah, good point. Christy, you want to comment on that? Yes, we could. <laughs> good answer. Um, Andy. Yeah, and I was challenged as well uh, on this one by the fact that Christy pointed out that minor hockey doesn't always come through in using their ice time. So um, for me, that's a challenge in that, you know, they're tying up the space, but the arena's empty and other users could be using it at that time. So I think it makes sense to nail down minor hockey more consistently, if that's at all possible. And that, you know, that making sure that, that uh, the priorities that we're making uh, are actually being utilized because it does, you know, it does make sense. I could understand the frustration of the of the beer leagues, um, uh, you know, the senior users if they're if they see the arena sitting empty during prime time. Yeah, Christy, any any comments on that? I, I like do just want I, nail down youth hockey. <laughs> Yeah, I do just want to speak on their behalf as well, as much as I, I can imagine how frustrating that is for them. A men's group has been pushed a couple of hours. They turn up early to, to dress and they see that the space has been empty when they had wanted the ice 
anyways. Absolutely can understand that. But to, to advocate on the side of Greater Trail Minor Hockey, you know, they're a big organization, volunteer run, managing three different facilities in the region. It's certainly not an intent of theirs to do that. And we have, we constantly work with them and their volunteers are incredible. We have um, two local people here that I know very well running the, the program there for the, la the scheduling and the um, president of the program for the last couple of years. And they have ac absolutely done everything within their ability to tighten that up. And it, uh, I don't know how much more we can expect there from them. Uh, so I just want to make sure that that it is understood that as much as this does happen, and I can imagine the frustration, it's not that they're lazy or that they're not doing their best on it. Uh, and also that they're not doing, they're not just buying the ice time and, and holding it ransom. So how, how often does it actually happen? How often does it sit empty? We do watch that. We have our operators have a, um, a, uh, a paper um, tally that they keep. And it's, I think it's mainly for the ammonia um, evacuation. If need be, they can see how many are in the facility, but they mark non-use. And uh, in some of my data reports I did for you guys, when we were weighing the arena stuff, I did have that number then I don't have it handy now. Um, it does vary per year because they have to book their ice time prior to them having registration pinned down. And they're dealing with provincial associations you know, they're dealing on different levels of stuff. BC hockey makes it a little bit difficult on their end. So it's not them choosing to do it late in the game. That's, that's just what happens when they're in the, how that organization runs. So at some point, once they have their registration at, at that point, do they know which ice they aren't going to use and could they give it back to us? And then we could offer it to the Eagles or the fossils or whatever, if they wanted to move forward. Yeah, we do take back the stuff that they're not using, but but it's not consistent. I tried to kind of speak to that a little bit in my email, but it's not like they're always missing Friday at six, but then not giving it up. They're yeah. missing a Friday at six a couple of times, a Wednesday at you know four a couple of times. So it's it's difficult for them. I can see, you know, I really could argue strongly on either side of this one. Um, the legacy teams, it makes sense to make space for them and not, I mean, conceivably with the policy, the way it's been and the way it still is, minor hockey could have all the time if they just kept saying they wanted more and there would be no time left for the adults um we don't want that obviously you know by we have to prioritize youth because of they have to have the after school time initially um allowing a legacy piece makes absolute sense that prioritizes men unfortunately over the women when it comes to the fields uh having and and unfortunately for the warriors that could pose a problem for them because they're not as long standing because of that break in play so it might not solve one of the bigger problems we have right now anyways Dirk's mention of a percent, so prioritizing youth up to a percent, and you need to give me time to come back with what that should be based on probably the 2019 season is what I'd work off of. I'd eliminate tournaments, just look at regular scheduling and what minor hockey used um, for percent of ice time available in 2019 season, our last normal season. You know, I could write that into a policy. We could bring it back at next meeting uh, with that written in there. And then after that percent is done, adults get it. And then minor hockey gets or, or youth get anything that's left. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea. Okay, I'm going to try and catch up. I wrote down Stu has had his hand up and then I've got Dirk and then Chris, but I'm not sure if Dirk just had his hand up or not. He did. Okay, Dirk, no. Stu, yes, and then Chris. Yeah, I just don't think it's going to be possible to come up with a policy that's going to be perfect in every situation. You know, I, I think staff need to have the latitude to show discretion and solve the problems in the best interests of the situations that come up. And, you know, I mean, as long as the policies we have enable that and aren't forcing weird situations to happen, then I think they're okay. You know, we can come up with more and more prescriptive rules, but that'll probably just create more problems. You know, yeah, I think that's a good point. We're, we're trying by by Dirk's suggestion of trying to prioritize to a certain percent. That that is kind of trying to find that balance, right? You know, if you have too little in there, then it's like kids get everything, and that, you know that doesn't that doesn't work. But that's out. but that's not what it's not happening now. People aren't getting anything now. Staff yeah. are working with the with the rules we have. And we're, we're, we're finding a balance. If we, we, whatever we put in place, we're just going to try and, you know, I, I don't think policy has to map reality that closely. Yeah. We have reasonable rules. I don't think we get to go too far with this. 
Yeah, good. Yeah, we don't want to micromanage for sure, but we're trying to find something that, that works for the community. Um, Chris, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, Christy, these ice times are paid for by Greater Trail Minor Hockey, correct? They are. Um, there is the discrepancy between the youth and the adult rates. So the youth rate is less. When minor hockey's in there, it's less than when the adults are in there. Regardless of whether the ice time's used. Yes. They, oh, yes. I see what you're saying. Yes. If they are a no show, they pay that fee. Regardless. Okay. Um, is there a provision to um, open up the ice time if, if they know that they're not going to? Can they phone ahead and say, we're not going to use it? Yeah, but that and doesn't work for the can... men either. It's not, it's not the one-off little sliding ins that's the problem. Everybody's working with me on that. That's not, that's not a problem at all. If um, it's the the fact that the men are, are scheduled on Tuesdays at whatever time, uh, it's later than they'd like. If one week it's available earlier, it's too much work for these guys to try to get a hold of all their their volunteers just doing this because mm -hmm. they like to play hockey. Um, so to get get in touch with all their players and back it up an hour for one week only, it's available. Um, it's really a matter of making sure that when we set the schedule for the season, you know, everyone's going to have to give a little bit in a perfect world. So, you know, the men are going to be a little later than they'd like. The kids aren't going to get quite as much as they'd like. Uh, and special events get priority because they're special events. So I, th I think I could work quite well with Dirk's suggestion. And I think that would allow me to continue working with minor hockey who are wonderful to work with, as I said, um, and they'd be happy because it's not limiting the ice that they've already got. And it's only limiting how much they can grow within Rosalind. They still have two other arenas. Uh, and it gives the men the security that they're not gonna lose the ice time. They might get shifted 15, 20 minutes, but they're not losing their ice time that they've had for decades. Yeah, I think that maybe we could refer this back to staff with these comments. Andy, your hands up. Just that uh, I'm wondering too about uh, resident versus non-resident use. <laughs> uh, just because the, uh, uh, I'm not sure. I remember the numbers from a few years back were that it was quite a low percentage of Roslyn youth that were actually participating in hockey. Whereas when it comes to the men's, and I'm thinking beer league, not not Warriors. It sounds like the Warriors is, is more of a, a community or a regional team. Um, but I'm thinking of the beer leagues where it is mostly Roslyn residents that are actually utilizing the facility. Uh, I don't know whether there's any consideration for who is actually using it, resident versus non-residents, but I would hope we're prior to prioritizing residents. But when we're greater trail minor hockey, those kids come from uh, all the lower Columbia is my guess. Chris, do you have any comment on that? Um, yeah, so when you look at minor hockey as an organization, the percent of, of players from Rosalind is low, but our players also are using Fruitvale and Trail facilities. So because it's one of those regional organizations like Kootenai Youth Soccer Association, um, they, they're not subject to TRP in the other arenas. Um, it is a regional program where the organization looks at the three arenas and books it across the board, regardless, the players are the players, regardless of where their community is. It's a, it's a regional organization because the last thing that we want is a kids hockey league in Rosalind, one in Trail and one in Fruitvale, you know, have the way it is right now and looking at that as a resident program. Um, I believe is the only route to continue with forward. But you are right with the the men beer league is essentially almost all Roslanders. Okay, uh, Terry. Yeah, yeah, I, I should uh, declare that I play on both fossils and eagles. So uh, I have a little bit of a, an issue here, but I just, uh, I'm encouraged by the idea that um, there, there might be a solution. I echo Stuart's um, comments that um, you know sort of guidelines versus rules i'd hate to get shoehorned into a policy that doesn't allow for some common sense and or you know a, a little bit of latitude to see if we can work it out i mean the guys are the guys are gonna they're like they want nothing more than uh, besides playing hockey themselves but to encourage youth and and the rest of it to to play as well but uh, it's got to be a solution thanks Okay, I'm, I'm going to suggest that we refer this back to staff and just with the comments that are in just for a little refinement and with, you know, not micromanage, keep it flexible enough, but also make it so we can sort of round round the sharp edges here if that if that's all right. Andy. Didn't our, didn't we already do that? I think she, aren't they coming with, to us with, you know, a proposal that does allow this level of flexibility or, or can she, can Christy see a way that you know, forward that will give her 
what she needs. Well, I, I think if I'm hearing Christy correctly, she said that she did have something here that she could work with to, re to refine a bit. Christy, did I misunderstand you? No, if the, ten if the intent of council, it sounds to me like the intent is to make sure that there's a lot of space for those legacy adult teams to still have ice time and that that is very close priority or a very close second to making sure that youth continue to have space. And with Dirk's suggestion on looking at the percent without it being ridiculously, you know, um, specific, you know, give me another couple of weeks with it and I'll see if I can come up with something a little bit more refined. Yeah, I think that that sounds great. Dirk, last kick at it. Yeah, just um, part of having a percent in there or some sort of loose cap as a guideline is in part for the readers as well. Somebody reading this thinking, oh my gosh, kids are going to get it all. That's not really fair. But if there were an indication in there that that's considered, then uh, I think it's nice for the readers as well. It still leaves Christy flexibility to wedge everybody in there. Okay, so motion to refer. Okay. All right. Can we just keep the motion that's on the table first? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so we are uh, gonna vote on uh, approving the policy as amended and we're going to shoot it in the head. All in favor of that policy? Nobody, well, I think nobody. Okay, all against it, go for it. Okay, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay, yeah, sorry about that, Cynthia. Okay, so now we have a motion to refer. I think Janice made it and Carrie seconded it and further comment, don't think we need it, all in favor. Okay, and thank you. And Christy, do, do your best there. That's great and we appreciate it and come back to us when you're ready. Okay, moving on. We are now finally into eight staff updates and reports. Um, first up is the RCAC art installment request. Um, and there's two requests here. One that we approve that staff in the RCAC proceed with relocating equilibrium from its current and further that we approve installation of the new piece back where the old one was connected um, as part of their uh, art lease program. Do I have a mover? Somebody, Chris, okay, how about a seconder? Andy, okay, any comments? Chris, nothing? Chris, I'm yeah. always willing to support the arts. Okay, good man. Andy is the seconder? Yeah, same here. I, I think uh, it, would, it seems that this is a regular ask and maybe we need to put a a budget placeholder in place if we're going to continually um, you know, support these endeavors. Because it seems you know, mentioned in the report that there is no funds for this particular project. So I think it would make sense to do so. Right, well, that's also in the report that there's a plan, that there's a, a plan like an art plan that's gonna have a you know, potentially modest budget that we can look at that you know, and it's you know, as an as a in-kind contribution. So I think that's coming, but this one is just kind of happening right now, but the plan, and that came from a previous meeting um, before where we talked about the need for that. And I think when staff has, has time, they will get to it. Um, and that's an important thing. Dirk. Yeah, I think the only thing I questioned on this is that the, a fair amount of the cost is in moving equilibrium somewhere else. And I'm not sure that I would appreciate equilibrium any more or less in a different location and wondered if we need to move things. Why can't we just put something new in? somewhere else. Um, I, I think the point, that point on the corner is the, is the showcase point place for the, for the, for the traveling, for the loner exhibition. And, and when it's there for the year that it's leased, that's the spot. And if we decide to keep something, then we find a place in town that's a permanent spot. So I think that's sort of part of the Arts Council strategy is to keep that one space available for something new. Janice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my only concern is that, uh, you know, the Arts Council has previously installed a uh, sculpture that they then, you know, needed to get off their books because they couldn't afford to get any more grants. And so, and, you know, invariably, if we decide that, um, that uh, equilibrium ends up in a permanent spot, uh, we might as well just assume that at some point RCAC is going to try and get us to take it over as our own owned uh, piece of property. So it'd be nice to have an idea of what the cost and liabilities, et cetera, et cetera, that would be before, uh, before they put us uh, on the spot to do that. Good point. I don't know if staff has any comments on that based on our past experience with the, with the dancing bicyclists. I forget her name. Lily May, of course, Lily May. Um, 
Any staff comments? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think it all wraps into that, that plan that is, is a much needed one for a variety of reasons. One is the financial piece. The other one is it, it would, uh, these, these do keep coming up as one-offs. Um, and it's hard for me to involve planning and ops enough on when I'm creating these little reports as one-offs. So the idea will be um, to work with planning and ops and make sure that we have that plan in place and that would allow then RC to do the, RCAC sorry, to do their planning moving forward or, around how many sculptures they want. And then it'll also ensure things like, you know, we're not saturated and, you know, with art pieces and, and things like that, it'll allow, you know, us to put a cap on on maybe how many pieces we we would like to see. So I've I've already been chatting with Stacy um, a little bit on on how that works in a planning world, and uh, it is just a matter of finding the time to start working on that plan. Yeah, but, but, but this points up that it that it's it's important to get to you know when you can, and then for this one we can just address this one this year, and then hopes that we'll have the plan in place before the next one off comes up. Stuart, you had your hand up. Um, I think uh, Christy sort of somewhat addressed my concerns. I just my my thought is how much is enough. I mean, I guess we all have different perspectives on how much public art we'd like to see in the downtown. Um, you know, it does feel like we have quite a bit. Um, you know, do we need twice as much public art, or ten times as much, or are we are we good right now? I don't know. But that's why we, that's why we need our plan. That would be good. Sure just kind of strikes me that Stu's looking for an equilibrium. That was yes, all. Yes, I am. Oh, very good. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a motion on the table about this particular one. And I think our comments about the need for the plan are, are heard loud and clear by staff and it has been on their, on their radar, right? So I think we're all, on, we're all paddling in the same direction. I'm gonna call the question on this one, all in favor. Okay, and nobody opposed. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, now we've done, I'm seeing now I've got my pages in order, yay. Um, so we're up to pool operations, sad story of no staff. So uh, council, the, the staff suggestion is that we approve the pool to operate with limited capacity from June to August of 2021. So do I have a mover? Dirk moves it and, and Stu seconds it. Dirk comments. No, I'm, I'm just cognizant that I poo-pooed this last year and the pool was amazing as a resource for families and kids this COVID summer. So I wholeheartedly support it being open in any way it can be. Yeah, yeah. It's just sad we can't get enough staff for it. Stu, you were the seconder. Seems sensible to me. Yeah, okay. Anybody else have any comments on the pool? Janice. Well, I know that I know Chrissy gave us a very thorough report, which was great. But it, it is, you know, as she points out, it's a, unfortunately a bit of a it's a bit of a vicious circle where if we don't have our pool open and other pools aren't open, and you know, you have to be 16 to get your lifeguarding ticket, you can't. Uh, and then we have a really short window to have those kids work at our summer pool before they go off and start doing co-op programs at university, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it could, this could drag on for a couple of years just because you know kids can't get into the programs uh, and then aren't qualified to be hired and or you know everything else so uh, yeah it's unfortunate but I think that uh, as with last year trying to provide a, a level of service that people can enjoy uh, especially if we are looking at restricted activities again in the summer is really important and it was very well used and enjoyed last year so yeah. real happy to support whatever we can do this year. Yeah, yeah, a little bit is better than nothing. Andy. Uh, I realize we depend mostly on youth for these staffing positions, but are, is there an appetite or would there be an appetite if we put out the call to consider uh, Rosin adults being staff members, you know, community right. members that aren't jumping around and just thinking that maybe there's an opportunity there that uh, for a long time employee employment, you know, I mean, recognizing seasonal, but trying to get more consistent people. Um, I don't think there's a limit on age. I don't think it's just directed towards youth when we put out the call. It's just that's who's usually applied. Christy, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, it isn't specifically directed towards youth, but of course it, it does tend to attract that. It is also outdoors in the heat in 30 some odd degrees weather. It's uh, It would be a tough slog. And I just wanted to make one other comment. Um, you know, a lot of comments being mentioned, of course I'm wholeheartedly 
for operating the pool in its limited capacity this summer, but just managing expectations, our numbers and our usage of the pool last night or last year was high because the trail and Warfield pool were closed. So we can't expect that same amount of usership this summer. So I, I expect it will still be well used, probably back to what we're used to seeing in the past. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Okay, any, anyone else? Andy, your hand is still up, but I'm assuming you don't have it to say. Okay, I'm gonna call the question on this, limited pool, all in favor? Okay, yep. Okay, now, finally, we get to talk about patios, and I did not pull it up on my computer, so I either can, or if somebody wants to give us a verbal thing, Janice. I didn't get it. Oh, even more reason to have a verbal thing. Stacy, go for it. So, the short and long of it is um, we received, because of COVID, we received um, a couple of applications for sidewalk patios, and I didn't realize the existence of an old bylaw from 1998 that since I've been here has never been used. So anyway, but we realized we have the bylaw, so we do have to implement the bylaw and, and including all the costs. So the application or the report is to waive the fees of the sidewalk cafe um applications under it's called the street vending permit bylaw and then we will go to review the bylaw for all its requirements but basically the bylaw outlines you how much space you need for traffic and and how wide the sidewalk could be it's it's not about putting a cafe on road it's it's about sidewalks okay okay um so the resolution is that council waive the fee on all applications for sidewalk cafes under the street vending permit bylaw. Okay, and that seems reasonable. Um, let's get a motion to do that and a seconder and then we'll have a chance for discussion and questions. Who wants to move waiving Terry and Andy? Okay, so does anyone have questions about this? Seems pretty straightforward and that's a surprise to all of us that we actually had a bylaw for that, so. Stacy, I, uh, I thought I um, I thought I saw something about uh, we couldn't do it because it was on the highway. I mean that. No, no, no. We got we, there's that's, that's been different. dispensation from the Pope during COVID. All of that. We, there's there's been permission. I think highway still has to approve it though, don't they, Stacy? Again this oh, year. No, that what you saw in um, your information package was like a completely separate from this. So Clancy's applied again to the Ministry of Highways for. Um, to have a patio out on the highway. This is not on, on the sidewalk. And MOT are not permitting it this year. Oh, really? Okay, no. interesting. Huh, that's interesting. I'm surprised given that COVID is not done. Um, yeah, I know, we, 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 had, we had lengthy discussions with them. They had lengthy discussions amongst themselves. And I guess last year was a lucky year and they are not willing to do it again. Oh, that's wild. Okay, I haven't looked at the at the most recent information packet, so I didn't see that. Chris, um, Stacy, is this the same bylaw that uh, that regulates um, food trucks? No. No, different one. No, okay. the food trucks is regulated under the business license bylaw, and that regulates the distance a food truck can be away from existing businesses and the certain streets that the food trucks are allowed to be on, but that's not this bylaw. Okay, thanks. Dirk. Yeah, sorry, there was another event <laughs> taking place next to me, and I missed some of this. Does this regulate where on the sidewalk um, they go, like how far out, or? Yes. Uh, could yes. Only, I was thinking if they could be in amongst the trees on the parking side of the sidewalk. It's a lot easier for pedestrians to keep walking through rather than circling around trees and bikes and. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what it does. It, it basically regulates the space and, and it says if the sidewalk is so wide then you're allowed this many tables and there has to be this many spaces between um, tables and it does need improvements though because uh, like as I said it is from 1998 and there was an entirely different streetscape at that point so for now the the um, resolution is not about 
improving the bylaw. We have now put it on our task list as a bylaw to improve because it definitely needs to be improved. But for now, it's just to waive the fees for the permit, given that we have some applications because of COVID for these um, sidewalk patios. Who besides Clancy's has applied? Uh, the shovel okay. and Misty Mountain Pizza. Oh, okay. All right. Stuart, you had your hand up. So the existing applicants will apply, although the applicants, they'll apply under the existing bylaw. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's good enough that we can work with it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Chris, I think you have a conflict on this one. So just blank, blank yourself out. <laughs> oh, Andy. Well, oh, because Misty Mountain and the shovel have both applied, that obviously wouldn't be an issue with the, uh, the highways. Those are, those are if, if they potentially request um, to use a portion of the road, the city road, would this uh, apply or deviate in any way? Yeah, well, the, the actual, the current bylaw doesn't even talk about the road and they haven't asked for the road. So I haven't, um, you know, we could possibly talk about that with operations and, and see if there would be an issue for this year of using the road. But for now, that is, they haven't applied for that. Um, no, let's, let's just stick with, with the issue at hand, which is waiving the fee. Dirk, and then back to Andy. Yeah, I, I guess just my question is, what is what is the fee? I may have missed that, I'm sorry. $100. Oh, okay. I think, I'm just going to check right now just to make sure. <laughs> as long as, I, I think my only concern would that if we had chaos in the sidewalk patios and then bylaw had to get involved and then we're you know tanking because of the hours that bylaw has to spend on it i guess we just revoke the revoke it is a permit they do have to sign it and there's a number of conditions under the permit that they have to comply with so i don't foresee it being an issue yeah i don't either andy I, I know that they're looking at direct serving um, in this in these op, in these uh, potential options, uh, but also know that we're making an endeavor as a city to accommodate people who want to take takeout and want to use utilize public space in the community on the downtown core. So tables and chairs, et cetera. We're trying to accommodate that. Um, so I, I don't know. I like to uh, make sure that the, you know the city does continue to prioritize that and maybe. Maybe Scott will have an update on that tonight as well. Okay. Uh, anything else on waiving the fees for patios? So I just looked it up too. So a, a standard sidewalk, which would be your regular four meter sidewalk is a permit fee of $50 and a wider sidewalk is a permit fee of $100. There we go. Okay. All in favor? Oh, Stuart. Yeah, I, I just doesn't seem unreasonable to, you know, there's got to be a certain cost in you know, assessing and processing an application. I don't know, 50 bucks doesn't sound like a lot of money. Um, I, uh, I, we want, maybe we want to help businesses out, but yeah, you know, we, we, we do charge for all sorts of things and this doesn't seem like an onerous charge. No, it's, it's small, but it's one of those token things that we would do. I would say we would, we'd only be considering this because it's COVID. People can't, you know, have full capacity in their restaurants and it's been a very tough year and, we're, there's there's not a lot that that we've been able to do um, so to help. So this so, is so this is a temporary waiving of the fees. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. In fact, Perfect. it's just this year, right, Stacy? We're just talking this one year. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I should have made that obvious, but yeah, it's because of COVID. As a number of communities have done the same thing because yeah. of COVID. And the bylaw is going to come back to us when it comes back to us. It'll have new shiny features and a fee, which might be higher when we're done with COVID. Um, okay, I'm gonna call the question. All in favor of waiving the fees? Okay, good, carried. And Chris, if you're listening, you can come back. Okay, good. Um, all right, next up, invoices paid for municipal services in March, about 500 and some thousand bucks. Who's gonna move it? We approve it. Anyone has questions, now's the time. Terry moves it and a seconder. And a second set, those girls so quick. Any questions for Elma on charges and expenditures? None, all in favor? There we go. Um, okay, now we have our fabulous budget update for quarter one. 
always good to see it. We'll take, a, this is just information. So this is if you have questions or comments, we don't have to do anything with this one. Questions or comments, compliments to the chef, great job. Oh, okay, okay, good. And next, ditto, we've got a corporate management plan also for information, definitely a great recap, very helpful. Any questions, comments? Don't see any, okay. Um, now we're into more council information stuff. We've got our building permit report. I'm gonna read these and put your little hands up. Okay, Janice has something on this one, Janice. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I was looking at it and of course last March we had exactly zero activity in our building permit. And so I went back to 2019 just to compare uh, this year versus 2019. Uh, because I was looking at it thinking, geez, we've got, you know, some good stuff going on here. So in uh, 2019, we had 10 permits valued at uh, $19.4,000. And in 2021, we're 19 permits valued at $39.3,000. So uh, we're 1919 or 19. Yeah, 2019 was a great uh, building year for us. And we're actually ahead of that thus far this year. So um. That's keeping uh, that's keeping the planning department and Perry hopping, I'm sure. That's right. That's it's cooking. All right, building permit inspection. Any questions, comments on that? Do you have anything? Another good one. Um, how about our step code energy rebates? Comments there. All good. Okay, that's Dirk. Just nice to see that they're hitting their targets now. I hope that that continues. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. Um, and if staff has any comments on any of these things, you guys bring your smiling faces. Public Works report for March. Anything there? Good, busy, busy. Um, water production report. Okay, and updated task list. All right, we are flying. We are just flying. Okay, now we are up to members reports. I'm gonna start with Dirk. I got nothing this time. Okay. Andy, we've got your report there. Do you have anything else to add? No, nope, unless anybody has any specific questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions for RDKB? Busy, busy there. Stuart. Okay, nothing doing. Janice. Uh, yeah, I've got a few things. Not as much as last week. <laughs> last time. Uh, yeah, April 7th, I... Uh, work with Kristen and planning to produce an introductory video for the economic task force thought exchange program that uh, we're planning on rolling that out this week to our local businesses and uh, entrepreneurs, employees, etc. Uh, I met with Scott from public works and a number of neighbors in the Redstone area to determine uh, best solution uh, for all. So a city can access a sewer storm manhole that's in a bit of an awkward location in a right away. What was uh, the result on that? I was, uh, you know, it's um, ongoing, <laughs> but it was a typical Rossland, uh, Rossland thing where Scott and I thought we were meeting, you know, one or two other people and, you know, everybody came out to stand around and look at, uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's, uh, nothing's ever quick in Rossland and it's always a bit of a party, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but it was good. I mean, it was, it, you know, the neighbors were very, yeah. Yeah, and Scott was great with everyone. So I think we're making some progress. So everyone will be minimally um, upset and uh, also minimally happy. Good, best out. Uh, yeah, sometimes that's the best you can hope for. Uh, April 7th and 13th, I attended Economic Development Task Force meeting. So as I mentioned, the group's planning on launching their outreach tool later this week. Uh, April 14th, I attended the Midtown Transition Meeting, reviewed the final bids for the project and the performers for the residential portion. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that came in a bit of late information is that BC Housing has actually increased their grant proportion uh, to over $6 million for the residential portion. So the, um, the rentals are going to be affordable for households ranging uh, that have incomes ranging from forty dollars to $56,000 a year. So 56 is the high end for a three bedroom and 40 for a, uh, a one bedroom. So that's household, whether it's one, two, six people, household income. So that's, uh, that's really great. And, and then on the 15th, I attended a regional recreation committee meeting to discuss ways to encourage and provide better access 
to uh, recreation in the region. That's about as far as we got. I'm doing some more information gathering for that particular committee, but yeah, all good stuff. Great, that's great, thanks. Um, Terry. Hey, I got a few things. Um, April 7th, I uh, attended uh, yet another Zoom call around the, from uh, the Energy Task Force and listened to Ken Holmes uh, talk about right sizing your furnace. So that was great to uh, know that that resource is out there. So uh, uh, kudos to Energy Task Force uh, and harnessing that local knowledge. Uh, I talked about April 14th, but I'll just review that again, that OCP uh, meeting on the environment topic. Um, uh, again, um, had great conversations around bear smart invasive species and uh, Anthony Bell was there from RC as well to talk about there and got some good, uh, hopefully got some good input for the OCP on um, the environment and uh, uh, April 14th, was it the same day? I think it was. Um, library board meeting. So we welcomed uh, Stacy Bowden as the new director and the AGM was held. Richard uh, Kemick is the new chair there. Um, and they were having, uh, they're moving forward on their hiring a student uh, summer reading program, activities for Earth Day, circulation is up. Uh, and they had some training for staff on de-escalation. So that, that came up again and uh, um, so that was uh, my report from the library board, and that's me. Great. Chris? Uh, on uh, the 11th, I attended the, um, a meeting of the Kootenai Rockies Disc Golf Society um, out at, uh, at uh, Little Bear Golf Course. Now, they've created an 18-hole disc golf course out at Little Bear that's uh, it's going to be um, a championship course. It's very challenging, very long. But uh, the highlight of that was uh, unanimous across the board to explore 18 more holes at uh, Thin Air Disc Golf Course pending further discussions with Blackjack and Beaumont Logging. So the um, society has quite a bit of money. Um, so to expand that course is gonna really uh, help with uh, some tourism opportunities and economic development here in Rosslyn. Uh, on the 12th uh, Heritage Commission meeting, um, we installed the new cemetery kiosk signage uh, depicting the plots and a bunch of updated cemetery history, um, as well uh, working on some even better collaboration with our local stakeholders and partners through involvement in the Heritage Management Group, which meets quarterly. Um, thanks, Stu, for your input on last meeting. It was really valuable. Um, and on the 14th, the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society meeting for the Midtown project. Um, and uh, right now we're working on uh, some final budgets and building permits and operating agreements with the uh, society. Um, and then uh, as with Janice and, and Kathy, um, the Regional Recreation Committee, uh, I sat in on the discussion um, with regards to the TRP. Uh, good general discussion on some opening dialogue with Trail um, and to better help understand the pros and cons of the TRP and how it affects our community and how we can be better there maybe. Um, and an emphasis on discovery of change with, uh, with our recreation options to more of an independent recreator uh, with outdoor focus, less team focus, more individual. Um, it was interesting, the note of volunteerism that uh, uh, that came up a topic that came up in that conversation and that um, and it's real if if there's a barrier to being there um, the volunteers tend to wane so if parents are, you know they're not bringing their kids to trail then they're not helping which uh, is a real detriment to the teams um, and then uh, and then discussion of the real recreational staffing issues during COVID um, with the pool. And then uh, also I've got two motions here that, uh, that I wanna put out to everybody. Um, the first one uh, is motion one to provide a letter of support for our upcoming BC community gaming application. These are both for the museum uh, uh, and discovery center. Um, so provide a letter of support for our upcoming BC community gaming application due on April 30th. In the arts and culture stream. Uh, if awarded the grant to, if awarded the grant, the Rosslyn Museum and Discovery Center will 
utilize the funds for community engagement to meet the growing demand in the community for educational engaging programming, ongoing hands-on activities, community events, school group tours, outreach, educational kits, and a particular focus on the Discovery Center aspect of the operation. Coupled with this, the grant will fund the archives collections, archives slash collections, preservation and public accessibility, which ensures the operations of the archives and museum collections, including regular exhibition development. Collections care, research, and public accessibility to the community history collection held in trust at the museum facility. Um, all Joel, or sorry, Sarah's words. <laughs> um, and then uh, the second motion. Now, do you want to do the first motion first? Yeah, let's do the first one. Let's do the first two. So you move it. Let's get a seconder. Janice seconds. Um, do you want to speak any more to it, Chris? Or uh, no, I think it's uh, it speaks for itself. Okay, I'm curious. Um, it's it is. how much are they looking? Well, it's, it's it's a it's a support for a letter of support for uh, gaming grant. Right. How how much are they looking for? Do you know? They didn't say. Okay, that's all right. Uh, Janice, as the seconder, do you have a comment? I think this is a grant that they go after every spring. As, uh, and as indicated by Sarah, it, it continually sort of refreshes and uh, supports their summer operations and some of their extra archival and, uh, and uh, work, programming okay. work. It's kind of twofold there, yeah. Okay. Any other comments on this? Letter of support? All in favor? Okay, no one opposed. They get a letter of, for, of support. Now, number two letter of support or whatever it is. For the Rossland Museum and Discovery Center, their, uh, their ecology club is, uh, is creating a, a garden rewilding project. So the Rossland Museum Discovery Center is seeking support from our community to help make the project happen. And they're um, rewilding the, the gardens around, uh, around the museum. Um, and what they're looking for is for the public to contribute funds, supplies, building materials, volunteer time, et cetera, in support of this project. What they're asking us to do is provide a letter of support. Um, who is that letter of support to? It's to the Museum uh, Discovery Center Ecology Club. And uh, Sarah Takama um, uh, slot would uh, be the person to contact with any more information. Oh, okay. Because I'm just curious. It sounds like if they're asking the it, if they're asking the public when we write a letter of support, it's usually to support some grant application, and I don't hear a grant application here. This is a letter of support for their um, project, so the rewilding project. And now I'm okay okay well, i think we've, they came across my desk this morning <laughs> i'm sure we i'm sure we can support it because it's a good thing but i'm just not sure when we write a letter of support it's usually to like cbt or to the province or or someone we don't just write it to the citizens of Roslyn necessarily so i think we we need some more information there but it sounds like a good project okay terry and then andy and then dirk um it sounds like a great idea i just don't know why they'd need a letter of support <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm confused. Um, yeah, well, yeah, okay, so. Andy. Yeah, I wonder if they're seeking permission as well because it is uh, Roslyn property. Yeah, they have an existing garden there already. There is, this is their heritage, their heritage garden spot that they're talking about, Chris? I think so, yeah. I think so. yeah um, well, interesting. Well, rewilding is just not pulling the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> Works really well. <laughs> Goes with the uh, the um, herbicides. Yeah, um, Dirk, did you have your hand up? I, I like wild gardens and ecology clubs, but I did not have my hand up. Oh, okay. All right. Anybody else on this? I think. I mean, if we if we agree to write a letter of support, we need more information about who we're directing it to, and and you know that whole thing. But the the concept sounds good. Right, so I think we can we can vote on whether we're going to provide some letter of support. They're not asking for money; they're just asking for our verbal thing. So we can either support. do it or we can ask for more information and then do it later. Okay, so I think we should just do it. I think we should. My, just do it. my opinion. <laughs> Let's not overthink this, right, uh, Andy? Or, or we're voting? Okay, okay. All in favor? Okay. All right, good. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thanks. Well, that's it. That's it for you. Okay. Okay. I don't have that much this week. You'll be happy to know. Um, I've been doing the weekly mayor's calls um, with, uh, with IH, the, the uh, round table, and I send those notes to council when I get them. So I hope that you're finding those informative. Unfortunately, they usually come on Friday after our info package has gone out. So you get it a bit late. Um, I mean, I could just send them to you guys directly and not worry about that. That might, that might be helpful. Um, also had the calls with uh, Minister Osborne and she usually invites a, a guest to come um, and I circulate those notes also. There have been different ministers that have come on to talk about different things. Often it's COVID, often it's other um, you know, local government things. Those happen every two weeks. And then we had a Zoom with LCIC, CBT, local mayors and electoral area directors for area B with a director from area B to discuss a funding proposal that LCIC has put to CBT. Um, CBT in their, in their new strategy, short-term strategy, um, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what they support in this. Um, they were sort of somewhat interested, but non-committal. So that's as far as we can go with that. And this is, this is LCIC trying to get a quite a large sum of money to continue their, their various economic development projects for the entire region. Um, and all the local mayors were on, which was good to show support as, as, uh, you know, as a group. Um, we had the meeting, the Midtown Transition um, meeting, the material's been out, everybody knows about that. Um, already mentioned the Roslyn Regional Rec Committee met. So Janice and Andy and I with Chris in as, as what were you? You were an attendee, you weren't even a panelist, right? And then, uh, so that was good to see where we're going there, kind of work on that. I wanna remind everybody that AKBLG is um, this Saturday, the 24th. So you can sign up and go in and vote on resolutions. We have our resolution in there. Um, and then it's just a one, it's usually a couple of days in the spring. This time it's just gonna be, I think one day, I'm not even sure it's a full day um, to do resolutions, the AGM and resolutions. And they're hoping to do a live event in Radium in October, COVID permitting. Um, so that's that. And the last thing that I don't think got mentioned was the Energy Task Force is doing their electric car event. Um, and that is the 28th at 7 p.m. as a Zoom, Zoom call. And that's it. So, oh, uh, are, are you guys going to, to Dirk? Um, <clears throat> are we going to do a letter of support for the community garden? Oh, did we not vote on that? I thought we did. I don't. I don't recall doing that. No. I'm having I'm having a, a senior moment. I'm sorry. I thought we voted on it. Um, okay, let's vote on it. So we've got we've got. Did we vote on the we voted on the first one? So this is the second one. This is the one. The letter of support to whomever for whatever for the museum for the rewilding. No, okay. no, it's for uh, it's for Laura and uh, Laura and Penny and the um oh, for the, oh, to try and get oh, funds from the CBT. That's right. Okay, okay, you're right. You're and they right. need no, it for the end of this month. That's so right. We should they, probably vote on it now. They need it before we'll do again. Yes, thank you about that. Okay, so Dirk makes the motion. Janice seconds it. Um, any further discussion on that? Seems like a great deal. All in favor? Okay, great. Thank you for that. I totally gapped. Okay, so with that, we are going to recess to an in-camera. And this is because we're going under section 91A, personal information about identifiable individual. Um, do I have a mover to go in-camera? That is Andy and Janice, and I don't think there's any discussion. All in favor, off we go. And thank you, anyone still as an attendee. And I think we stay on this call for that. We don't have another. Another one, we'll just get people off there, close that. Okay, I think everyone is gone, attendees are gone. So we are going to call to order and I'll have a motion to adopt the agenda. Dirk. Sorry, what? do we stop, don't we stop recording for this? I just noticed it's recording.